good evening and welcome to our book club this evening. We are going to be talking about um, Dr. Wink's chapter eight and nine. And uh, as Bill mentioned, I put in the chat the quotes um, that I was just highlighting, but feel free to use the quotes that, um, that resonated with you as you read. Uh, but I'm gonna open us with um, a prayer uh, actually from the New Testament, um, and just in light of, of both chapters. And so let us gather together in community, coalition and deep love. God, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. But I say to you that here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to those who strike you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from those who take away your cloak, do not withhold your cloak as well. Give to everyone who begs from you and of those who take away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Amen. Amen. And so this evening, um, I was wrestling with a lot of the quotes that you see on those pages. Um, I recently just came back from the border between Poland and Ukraine and met with a number of women who left their husbands behind. Um, and despite their lament, they had deep hope that they would see their loved ones again. It was interesting to listen to, to their determined resolve and their hope in the space of profound darkness. And I wanted to ask them um, in that space, what would have it looked like to not take arms and to not to bear arms in that space? But I couldn't. When I spoke with many of the women, some of them who experienced violence themselves as they moved westward towards the Polish border, commented to me the horror stories of what they witnessed as they traveled across to seek safety and leaving their loved ones behind. And I couldn't ask them that question for some reason. And I wrestled with that because I came off of a wonderful conversation with Bill Wiley Kellerman, who invited me to read and reread William Stringfellow and come back into a deeper relationship with the Pauline theology of the powers and principalities. And so I've been rereading this and, and trying to, to lean into my faith so that when I encounter, because I will be seeing the women again um, soon, and when I encounter them, what, what can I engage with in a space of nonviolence? In that space, when I encounter and witness in that dark hope of the women who are hoping to see their partners again, how can I engage more creatively and more imaginatively in that space and offer meaning in that space of absolute suffering? Their concerns, their worries, their fears, their anxieties of not only their husbands that are fighting in a war and are facing, facing their own annihilation, but deeply a violent annihilation up against their own ongoing struggles to survive. And the possibility of what does it mean to breathe in that space, to recenter, to reconnect, to find meaning in that suffering? What does it mean for them and their futures of their children that they carried with them a lot out of Ukraine into the West? And so I'm wrestling with this, everyone. This is where, when I, when I identified those quotes and listen to being blessed as a peacemaker and what does it mean in the space of absolute 
dark annihilation of profound violence? How do I encounter and counter the powers and the principalities in that space? So I ask you as we come into our breakout rooms to reflect on this theology of the powers and our relationship to the theology of the powers. How do we navigate through these very complex strategies that we face in the face of absolute dehumanization? How do we actually creatively and innovatively speak to each other, especially those amongst us who've been profoundly violated, profoundly dehumanized. How do we encounter them in a space of this love and imagination in real time? That our reactiveness is not to try to join in the violence and not to amplify the suffering from that violence but to quiet in that space, because I'm having a hard time quieting. And so I'm hoping I can hear from each of you your tactics, your tactics for bringing us back into this space where we, re we redeem and reimagine a new way of belongingness. So that's where I'm at. I, I, I am challenged because after I spoke with Reverend Bill Wiley Kellerman, I have, I, and I still have faith because I'm walking into those waters as you read in, this, in, in chapter eight, before they part. But as I walk into those waters before they part, I'm listening to Reverend Bill and I'm like, ah, oh, please help me not react in that space. Because when I'm confronted and engaging with people who wish to bear arms because they are hurting, because they have been dehumanized and their way through is to reclaim through a violent act, I'm wondering where I can be in this theology of the powers that resituates and reimagines a different way. And each of the examples that Dr. Wink provides have been really inspiring to me. And each of you have experienced examples and live into action each and every day. That helps inspire me to encounter in a different way. But I find myself triggered right now. I have to just be very clear with all of you. Um, you know, coming back from the border and thinking and rethinking, how can there be another way in the face of sheer violence? Because there is another way and I have hope with that other way. And each of you have deeper expertise than I do. And in witnessing each of you, I'm hoping to re-inspire and reanimate and re-engage in a faith that I don't let go of, but it's tested, to be completely frank with all of you. And so the quotes I put in there are quotes that I'm trying to still wrestle with, this work of nonviolence and how we, in the struggle with the powers that be, how can we do the task of unity and engagement and belongingness when that unity is consistently being tried um, and ripped asunder? And so I invite each of you in breakout room to lift up and highlight parts of chapter eight and nine that does this conditional of what if and reorients it into a theology of the powers that helps us engage in a liturgical action that animates deep peace. And how do we do that in a, such a reactive space of violence? That's my question to each of you. 
And I know you're not here with me in Europe and going towards the Polish border at this moment, but that border is with us right now and in each of our lives in some way. And so I invite each of you into that space of, because it doesn't need to be Poland. It could be Flint, Michigan, right? It could be, you know, New England where I'm from. It could be Brazil where someone went here is, is working in. It could be anywhere. But it's at that border, I'm in that liminal space that I'm struggling with right now. And so in that struggle, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to hear from each of you, from your tactics, your experience, your deep space of peace and centeredness, where your work is and how we collectively are peacemakers called as children of God. And so with that, I will leave you with the, the, the document that's in the chat for you to go into breakout rooms. And I'm gonna invite Bill to put us in those rooms um, to wrestle with some of these questions, or if you wish to go beyond the what if and into the space of where you are based on the chapters, I welcome that as well. Great, spring fellow. But welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, to uh, and I'm I'm curious to hear, um, which is far less of an athletic game than it is like a how, really how each game. of you. Uh, I don't know who is. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm curious to hear how all of you fared in your breakout rooms and then what you discussed and what you spoke about and what was going on um, in your breakouts. So, does anyone want to start us out? No, in the little group I was part of, we were five, and but the really struck me the key idea, and I have to leave momentarily is the, the, the difference between thinking about nonviolence as a strategy and as a way of life. And a good bit of the conversation focused on living, living the dream through communities such as the FOR and especially wow. the, the smaller groups, the, the chapters in various cities. And I shared some stories from Mem my years in Memphis and from here in Southern Ontario, stressing the importance of community formation and a, developing a deep spirituality. And as one of the members of the groups to, and knowing that we are in some sense uh, connected to the divine, to God, however we want, we want to discuss, name the, the holy, the other. It was a very fine discussion. Thank you for the five, to the other five. Absolutely. Do other members of that, that group of five uh, or six um, uh, want to add to that? Thank you, Paul, for that. And I, I want to highlight what you also said is that you know, because Anthony also shared this, is that the importance of stories and your and 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 telling of your experiences, like sharing those experiences, and and because that is so critical, I think also to what you were talking about, Paul, about community formation, like that, like you know, I I was lamenting when we, I was in my group, like that 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 piece of community formation seems to be missing in the arenas that I'm in sometimes because. Perhaps I'm not telling the stories that I'm not sharing the stories that you're sharing with others, right, Paul? That, that those powerful, transformative stories that are on that front line uh, from the field and that connect to how you were formed, right? How you and how you also in turn form others, right? How it's this collective formation to that togetherness of coming, bringing every in the space, right? And so thank you for highlighting that, Paul, and being that, because that, that I think also helps mitigate this lamentation I have about, oh my gosh, what is, I'm in, I'm faced with generations of folks that, 
that that community formation that storytelling is different it's not the, the it's it or the valence of it is different if, if that makes sense that i don't know how we tell stories in deep ways that connect to the sacred the spiritual the divine um and that's part of us right part of your experience so i appreciate uh, paul i don't know if i captured what you yeah. said well but um you did and there are others from the group who were yeah. listening. yeah would others want to judith did you want to add to that yeah I, I might add one story that i we ran out of time and i didn't have time to share in the group but the whole issue of of life living that instead of using it just as a strategy and the importance of community development I need to read more, but I've been reading about a church in Indianapolis who was well known for their mission projects, um, had tons of them, were doing very well, but their, their conscious change has been recently, I think, instead of having people fill out a neighborhood person, fill out a form showing why they're eligible for their services, the form now asks, what do you have to give? And mm. so they've been capitalizing on this neighborhood around the church and the people who have something to offer. They've they've opened. I mean, they've had art shows. They've had cooking classes. They uh, turned a garage into a bicycle repair shop, you know, all kinds of different things that people have to offer. But building on that that community issue of how do we how does the church minister with the people in the community, not just providing services for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a deeper participatory thing, right? They're, they're engaged yeah. in yeah. a deeper way, yeah. right, Judith? Um, yeah. So I appreciate that. And that becomes a way of life too, right? If you, yeah. if you orient toward that. Um, Paul, you wanted to say something. Paul Dorn. Yes, yeah. uh, I'm reminded. There's I'm a lot of Pauls, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm reminded of um, what's his name Reggie something or other uh, who does uh, seminars around around the uh, country to uh, churches. But anyway, he tells the story of a group of Christians who uh, were in a particular uh, new area of the city and decided to form a congregation instead of doing what a lot of people do, perhaps most people, building a nice church, you know, and say, okay, folks, look, we're here, we're here to serve you, come and join us. Mm -hmm. They went around the neighborhood and did a survey and asked the people who lived in that whole neighborhood, what do you think this community needs? And it turned out that the majority of the people said, we need a recreation center. So that, that group of people, instead of building a church building, built a recreation center for the community and then used the recreation center for their community worship mm. services. Mm. But th that gave them a great amount of credibility in the community. Absolutely. And it sounds like there was a deeper attunement to the community in doing that, right? That that attunement actually was more than just church. Like it became like that sacredness actually was with the community and pervaded throughout the community because that there was a deeper attunement with, with community um, that allowed for that sacred. That, I mean, this is where I'm like, Again, I, I love these, and I appreciate these examples because it connects the material and the spiritual together, right? It brings together what this Pauline theology of the powers, which Dr. Wink writes so deeply about, really lifts up, right? That's part of how we redeem, I think, the powers of, that have fallen, right? It's, to re, it's almost to reclaim spaces, right? Because you attune to the community more deeply. That you that you connect more deeply to that community and and that the action is not hey come join our church right but we are part of you right we're part of this community yeah. and we're with you and what to listen right to really be exactly. present right? listening it's, present. listening is so important listening with the willingness to have my mind changed yeah 
Yeah. That is, that's so, so important in my, in my opinion. And Paul, that's transformative, right? Because, yes. because there's a, there, you're not set in that mind, right? That there is this, this movement in that relation. It's that relational theology, right? There's a, re, I am in relationship with you and that I'm not always going to be like, I'm, I'm not always going to get whatever I want or my way. Right. But because I'm in relationship with you, that we both work together to understand what we together right need. And unfortunately, that. sometimes I'm going to be a jerk. <laughs> yeah. And often I will be a jerk. Right. But if, if I'm truly in relationship with you, that you can hold me accountable in that space. Yeah. Right. That that if I am in 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 relationship with you. You also can say, hey, Fernando, wait a second. Like, this is this is actually really violent and like how you're with us in this space, right? Um, and that I can listen to that, right? To listen to that accountability and hopefully reorient, reframe, even though it may be challenging and go, hey, Paul, that was hard, right? But now I can, if I hear you, right, and I'm present with you and attuned to this context, right, that, that the, the divine can work in that space with us, right? The, the sacred, that sacred, the sacred space that we share, right, it helps to animate the work, the repair, the redemption, the engagement, right? Um, I have a strange attitude in that. I don't divide things between secular and spiritual. In my mind, everything is spiritual. Hmm. And um, worship for me, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing the Apostle Paul, worship for me is the way I live my life from moment to moment. It's not coming together necessarily in a group, singing songs, saying prayers, reading the Bible, and listening to good homilies. That is part and parcel, but all of life is how I worship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mm -hmm. worship the divine by whatever label you may put on the divine, mm -hmm. or even if you have a label. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Paul. And that's the everydayness in this, right? This yeah. is the this is yeah. the living into it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You no, know, I was I was I was raised Lutheran. And of course, the big thing with Lutherans is salvation by grace. And they mm -hmm. always forget to quote verse 10 of that Ephesians passage that the reason we're saved is to, to do good works. Um <clears throat> And uh, Martin Luther is alleged to have said, sin boldly. Hmm. And what that means, and I do kind of hold on to that, in, is God loves you, and there's nothing you can do that's going to make him, her, it, love you less or love you more. But you have liberty, you have freedom to contribute, to co what, what's the word I would use to co-create with God um, goodness? Mm -hmm. I mean, what the, what's, what's the image of God? To me, the image of God is to create and to love. Mm. I mean, it's simplistic, but mm -hmm. I try to live my life simply if I can. <laughs> Well, and that simplicity is actually quite complex, paradoxically, right? Yeah. 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 No, and, and yeah. I think it's that both and. And I think, like, for me, it's been, and I, I'm curious what others say, it's this manifesting love, right? And, 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 and that manifesting love core to this, the, the Bible, which is the sacred text that I, that I profess to, right, is that love. Like, the Gospels is love, right? And manifesting that love, the action of love is connected to, for me at least, this theology of power, the powers that Walter Wink writes about in these two chapters. It helps us get away from the what if, right? It help, and not get away from it, but actually clarifies so that we don't call into question, 
right? Our commitments to redeeming the powers because there's love that undergirds it, right? For me at least. And so that's why I'm, you know, I'm curious how all of, how, how, did, did, did have others sort of engaged with this differently or these two chapters as well in your small groups? Well, I may have been all out of whack because I have to admit, I have not read uh, Wink recently. I've mm -hmm. I read all of his books like five years ago and, and yep. they changed me. Um, so I may not have been responding to chapter eight and chapter nine, but thank you. No, you did that. actually, Paul. Like okay. What you said was, was actually really helpful. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Good. So, but did others in your small groups, what other sort of thoughts and ideas came through in your small groups? Mark, I noticed that you unmuted. Did you want to say something or? <laughs> I'm caught. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think one of the things that I take both from our discussion tonight and, and, and from uh, Walter Wing is the place of the enemy um, uh -huh. in my heart and life. And um, the place that I readily provide for the enemy is to, to allow me to be provoked by them mm. and uh, even to move to deep anger, if not hate uh, about them. But what I think with um, all our discussion and Dr. Wink's emphases, I'm learning is that the enemy has more to offer me than just the provocation. Yes. Um, which includes the opportunity to see the, see me uh, because yep. I'm a mirror of my enemy and yep. the provocation unleashes in me what I'm being provoked by in them. And um, if, if I can have the kind of worship that has been mentioned, that is in all my life, then I have, as we stressed in our group, the practice, the practice, practice, practice yeah. of coming from a different place and uh, and seeing my enemy in different ways and are most readily available, um, not just opposition and not just certainly not trying to defeat them, uh, but but using the insight that I see in myself to become the deeper, better self that God intends me to be so that my enemy has an opportunity that otherwise would not be available to them, perhaps that even that I can embody for, on their behalf to bring to that encounter a different opportunity than, than simply mutual provocation. And that's the actual gift that Dr. Wink writes about, right? Um, the gift of the enemy is that in a way it becomes a true a true and authentic mirror of ourselves in the other, right? That that the other is actually not our enemy in that way. Is that that we've set that that other as the enemy, but in a way, it's our projections on, right? We're getting triggered, yes. right, by that enemy, and then get that trigger creates this. We could act violently, right, because this is an opposition to what we perceive as ourselves. But in reality, Wink really pulls this and and pushes us to say, "Whoa, wait a second, you know what is what." How how can, you know, Mark, I really appreciate your words. This is in a way a reflection of ourselves in that enemy, right? Yeah. And in doing so, it also highlights, it really highlights our own challenges, right? In that projection of ourselves onto the enemy. Yeah. If we are awake to it, right? Or I mean, like for, for me, and I don't know how, Mark, you feel about this or others feel about, but the... For me, Dr. Wink is calling us into that space of being, you know, radically present with ourselves, right? Um, you know, really recognizing, oh, wait a second, you know, my absolute hate of that person, right? <laughs> right? Is perhaps my own work, like that's, you know, there's challenge, I put that on to them or that projection of that violence onto me 
right? Where am I in that space too, mm-hmm. right? Because that enemy allows me to actually recognize my own darkness, right? It's my own possession, right? You know. Um. So thank you for that, Mark. Did others in your group also feel this way, or did others have insight <clears throat> on that, or want to comment on that? So thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that insight. Uh, this is Carlisle. Go for it, Carlisle. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I raised in our small group is what is our superpower? Mm. Um, what do we bring to confront the powers that be, which often I see as interpreted negatively in the, uh, in the, in the wonderful writings of, of uh, Dr. Wink. But where are the, the naming of the powerful positive or God-given powers that Jesus had and that we are to emulate? Uh, Can we give it a name? Can we give a number of them, because I'm sure it's not just one thing, uh, names? And can we train people in those so that it, it, it can become a reality, given the fact that we are all fallen people? in my mm-hmm. view as a Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so how is it that we can come and confront the, the, the powers? I, you know, I don't have that power by myself when I'm doing mm-hmm. it with another power, hopefully the power of God, then I may have a power that I can bring to confront the evil powers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we talk, or I hear the conversations and, and, and Dr. Wink about confronting the powers, et cetera. What is it we're confronting them with? Hmm. How do people want to respond to that? Because I always think of Dr. Wink as saying, it's not just confront, it's naming, unmasking, and engaging, right? Right. It, for me, it's not even a confronting, it's engaging, right? To me, engaging is with, right? Is is that work of with, not an opposition. I'm not gonna meet you and almost like I'm for me, confronting has this 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 connotation of right, I'm gonna confront you with something that I have like a beef with you, right? I'm gonna confront you with that. But what does it mean to actually engage with you differently with that? Especially if. And that was that the conversation around force that I thought was interesting in that ch- in that chapter, the gift of the enemy, you know. And so, what does it look like if we are naming, unmasking, and this work of engaging, right? You know that 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 when I meet you and engage you or engage the powers, that I don't meet you with that violence. Right. Because I, I, I have faith as I walk into the waters before they part. I have faith, right, in that engagement for that redemption, the redeeming, the redemption of the powers. Right. Because the powers are good. Right. We all that the, 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 the deeper thing is that the powers, it's always in three. Right. That powers are good. The powers are fallen and the powers are redeemed. And in doing so, we engage. We don't, I don't know. And I'm, I, I know it might be sounding like I'm parsing these words, but there's something about the force of engagement that is different than the, confronta- the violent confrontation of the enemy, right? That in that space, in that spiritual space, in that sacred space, right? The possibility, the the, the imag- our imagination, how we use our bodies, our minds, our souls, spirits, right, our emotions, all of it, as it comes together, how that engagement allows for the imagination, that creative energy for transformation. And I don't know if that's what you were meaning, Carla, but I, you know, I'm, as you were speaking and as you were reflecting on what you were talking about in your group. You know, what, what does it mean to be in this space of 
you know, I pre because my tendency is like, what is it? What is what is I've named it? I've unmasked it. Now, what do I do to confront it? And I think Wink is actually inviting us to actually not confront, but truly just what does it mean to engage? Right. What does it mean to be in with the enemy and the gift that that enemy presents us with? But then because also no we're engaging with ourselves. But go ahead, Carla. Also, ahead. It, seem, it seems to me that we need to be able to unmask and to name the Absolutely. powers that yes. we are bringing. Yes. It's not just a matter of engagement, yes. I believe. Yeah. Though I, I don't disagree yeah. with any of what you said. However, yeah. what I do find in terms of what you just said, because you asked me for a comment, is much more at the 40,000 foot view. Yeah. Rather than what is it that I can actually, in a church, teach yeah. teenagers to do? I, I set up and ran for three years in Milwaukee, a mediation center. And yeah. I recruited 100 volunteers from the community. And we, we dealt with about 2,500 people in terms of referrals to the district attorney's office uh, by police in general. And yeah. the problems that they were having. And then took a week and I trained all of these people in mediation skills and, and uh, it, it worked out really quite well for as long as we had the LEAA money. And then some of that, some of the staff transferred uh, into um, uh, public schools at the junior yeah. high level. Um, it, so you can teach individual skills, but once we get up to the point of the 40,000 foot view um, it's all good, but we could be talking about entirely different things once we got down to the ground. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's Paul, I see you put that in the chat. Oh, yeah, Paul Colbert has some interesting things saying. Okay. Yeah. And Carla, I, I really appreciate it because in a way, you know, what does it mean to be on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. What does it really mean to be deeply on the ground, right? Not always in this you know, 40,000 foot above, right? But to be really, and to sustain that on the ground, right? To engage right. in that sustained work on the ground. Paul Paul Colbert, did you wanna yeah. add? Yeah, it, 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 it struck me um, um, as Carlisle was speaking this time and I, I, I missed the connection as we were in our small group, but in some ways, it's it's so obvious that we we've got love, compassion, mercy, you know those basic attributes. But at another level, those terms have become so commonplace and so misused that we lose sight of those. Mm. That that's part of what we're practicing. Uh, you know, one of the most basic uh, prayers, uh, Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, that it's, that's a deeply rooted aspect that we can name. Yeah. But those words get so twisted, uh, you know, as, as uh, Humpty Dumpty said, when I use a word, it means precisely what I want it to mean, neither more nor less. Yeah. So... No, absolutely. And so what do we do in that space practically then, Paul, do you think? If, if these words of love, mercy, and compassion, right, how do we in a way renew them um, in practice? And it's not just for you, Paul. I'm, I'm just putting out because you're, you're, you're bringing something that is really, I'm now wondering what does it mean to renew those words in this day and age that that ha it's, we almost get gaslit when we use these words because we, they become almost this very confusing, uh, the, the confusing array of what is, we're all, well, what, how do we, we all are doing this, right? Um, we're all in this, but are we, right? In a way, it's a tactic of the powers and principalities that, that are used often as well, um, that we can get caught up in and distracted by. So I'm curious from our, our community here, how do we, is there a way we can renew and re-engage with, with, with all three? Yeah. Perhaps not too helpful, but a thought. 
sometimes we call things power or we give things power and they have power because we have given it to them. They don't have power in and of itself. And an example from the scripture, um, um, I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, epilepsy mm. was considered an evil spirit. So projected onto that circumstance was this is evil. Mm -hmm. So things that aren't evil we call evil because of the matrix from which we are our light lived experience our our group our personal experience our reading our um has brought us to a good reason for being who we are mm. yeah we are getting a little because 8 30 i mean we're welcome to stay i know we have uh Fernando. Is it now two thirty in the morning in Amsterdam time, or is it one thirty? Yeah, it's two thirty. Oh. It's okay. It's all good. But anybody, and, feel free to, please, uh, please. We love the conversation. It's great. So Carlos or anybody, Paul Magno, anybody else hasn't Carol. Anybody wants to jump in, Trick. And Susan, I have to say, I really appreciate your uh, comment in the chat. Um, I'm actually going to close tonight with uh, a Muslim prayer for peace again, since it's uh, Ramadan is coming to an end next week on Monday, I believe. Um, and so I wanted to lift that up and thank you for that wisdom um, that you shared with Paul in the chat. So did others want to make a quick comment um, uh, or some insights or thoughts? Because um, this has been helpful and I don't, I don't know if folks had heard my conversation with um, Bill Wiley Kellerman, um, but I have been really interested in what does the theology of the powers look like in this day and age? What does it mean for us in a highly highly polemicized reality, at least in the United States. What does it look like for us to engage with this theology of the powers on the ground, right? Carlisle, I take what you say really seriously because I have a tendency to come way up because it's, it's sometimes a lot easier to be in this 40,000 foot above, right? Because the harder work of being on the ground, right, entails that, Oh my gosh, I was just in our breakout, I was talking about my lament of having to work with the younger generation of folks that I'm training and educating, um, who are every time I mention the sacred or the spiritual, like start running. They they literally want to run out of my classrooms because it is it's too much for a lot of reasons for them, right? Um, or I'm not the right kind of Christian, or I'm not the right kind of religious person in their eyes. Um, and so that's, you know, this is my struggle on the ground. Like I love this FOR community because in a way I don't have to translate a lot of the powers talk, right? Because we can wrestle with and engage with and un name, unmask and engage with the powers and, you know, sort of hold each other accountable for our words, what we mean, where we, we think about it and how we understand it in everyday life. But as I educate in these spaces, in these higher education spaces, um, you know, folks are asking me, well, what, like, why do you always, what does it look like to do a theology of the powers um, in these spaces that are often very secular? But, but for me, everything is sacred, right? Everything is, but how do, you know, how do we actually make this and enliven this in these spaces that I often lament in because there's the challenge of being, um, 
that that challenge of the powers and principalities operating, the tactics of that in these spaces as well, corrupting spaces that I'm in myself, that I can get distracted and pulled into. So I wanted to put that out because even in spaces that I find myself in, I'm curious how we can engage. Is it attunement to communities like what we heard Judith talk about earlier, or what Paul, or what all the Pauls that we're speaking about uh, in, in, our, in our chat today, or what Mark brought up? You know, for me, all of this is really helpful in thinking really more practically um, the transformative work of the power of theology of the powers can be, right? How we can manifest that even in our in our in the world that we're living in, in our in our context. Carlos, I saw that you just unmuted. Did you wanna say yeah. something? You know, in terms of the engagement, I think. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed the uh, conversation about Bill Stringfellow. It was reading his um, an ethic uh, uh -huh. for Christians and other aliens in a strange land that uh, landed yes. me in this group, in fact, um, because mm. I reached out to Bill because I there's several parts of it that I, I still can't quite penetrate. Uh -huh. And he suggested I read his book and then suggested I join this club, mm. this book club. Yep. So that's, yep. and I, I think, I mean, it's an editorial aside. I think Wink gives way too short shrift to Stringfellow. I think his ethic is a very complete book that I'm trying to fill in the gaps. And one of the things that I, you know, that that I really thought about this as you were talking uh, in in this, uh, I, I don't think it's as simple as not that not to imply. No, it's not just engagement. There is confrontation. Now, the confrontation is nonviolent, and that's yeah. the Christian ethic, is yeah. that we don't resort to violence, but it doesn't mean that we don't confront. Um, because, yeah, yeah. They, there's a people that are going along that we do engage with because they're just going along, because that's just the way to do it. That's the way to get ahead, the way to be popular. Yeah. But there's structures that do need to be confronted, and I think that's yes. a point yeah. that um, Strengthfell is making uh, over and over is that there, there are supernatural beings that are the collective yes. of, and those are the things that we're directly confronting. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, and one of the example would be, you know, that first exorcism that the Berrigan brothers did, the Catonsville action where it was a liturgical action confronting the power of death of the state. Yeah. Um, and I think especially as, you know, when you set us up for uh, this discussion, you know, how, how do we engage with that or grapple with that um, as missiles are raining down, as a policy of raping, as an instrument of war is systematized and systematically. Mm -hmm. Uh, used as we I saw a picture on Facebook today from a, 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 a friend that spent a lot of time in Russia and it showed two Orthodox priests with a sacred fire inside a military helicopter accompanying mm -hmm. the Russian invaders. And that to me is a clear confronting of a power that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do agree with the, the 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 idea that what we do is we indeed walk with love with mercy with justice and one of the things that strength fellow talked about and what one of the things that led him to the theology of powers to begin with he talks about uh his experience in uh post-world war ii europe mm -hmm. and ecumenical conferences and talking to people that had lived during the times of resistance and he's and so he said, you know, they were all engaged in resistance against the Nazi occupiers and the collaborationist forces. And, you know, so they had that in common. And they also had the common of a deep practice of prayer and a deep practice of uh, yeah. scriptural study. Yeah. So what what Stringfellow comes out with, you know, after this incredible um, diagnosis, 
that he wrote in 73 that he might as well have written it during the Trump administration. Yes. Because it's one after another of everything that all of us saw, especially these last four years and kind of in a hyperspace that's usually there in a low intensity kind of way, but just like in gross relief. You know, people saying the, th the things out loud that normally are kept in thought bubbles. Um, what he, you know, after this incredible diagnosis, his prognosis is uh, to live biblically. You know, mm -hmm. which uh, kind of for me, it was a bit of a letdown because I was like, OK, now we're ready to, you know, now we've seen it. Now we know what to do. And they said, yeah, be pray, <laughs> engage in community, uh, study scripture. You know, and then figure out through prayers, through discernment, the actions that you take. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to take this opportunity in our small group. I um, pointed out uh, a seminar that was uh, recent in uh, out of Notre Dame about nonviolent civil resistance in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and about all these different uh, actions and, and initiatives that people are, ta are doing that I thought were, were pretty great. Um, but yeah, those are a bunch of things that just kind of bubbling in my head uh, as, during this, this, this conversation. And yeah, and just trying to really uh, unpack this, that Stringfellow book from um, 1973. That yeah. is just so it's it you know it's it's deceptively small um you know it's a deceptively thin volume but man it's just so packed it's it so is dense. very packed it is yeah. very very packed and what i love I'm, I'm actually rereading my people is the enemy which is his autobiographical polemic and Again, so it could have been written last week you know, absolutely but it's there that i actually appreciate his definition of engagement and that's why you know it's 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 it is for me not necessarily confrontation, but this idea of force that Wink writes about, right? Wink learns from Stringfellow. Wink actually, you know, and if you talk to Bill Wiley Kellerman, there is this sort of there is this 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 enlivened community of theologians um, that actually take William um, uh, Stringfellow quite seriously, and Wink is is one of them, right? And so. And I appreciate that lineage. I appreciate that connection um, because it animates for me how Wink conceptualizes engaging the powers. You know, it's Stringfellow's it, 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 precise parable of being in and with, right? Living in East Harlem, right? And or, or being in community on Block Island, right? In Rhode Island. I mean, it's fascinating to sort of engage in that place of what he understands as, and as you eloquently speak to, and I thank you for that accountability around confrontation, because that's precisely what I think of as engagement, right? Um, and it's it's this, and, I, and it's again, not parsing words, but it's really deeply encountering, right? What we are doing, right? What we do in action, that liturgical action, um, that and I put in the chat for folks who want to read Wiley Kellerman's piece on William Stringfellow. Listen to this man, right after an encounter of Stringfellow speaking with Bart at the University of Chicago School of Divinity, right? And so, you know, this is all this invitation though of the powers that be to me, right? This is what Wink is really bringing us to in the space and reclaiming almost Stringfellow, reclaiming, and, and before Spring, uh, Stringfellow, like the Pauline powers, the principalities and powers, right? That Pauline theology, that in the Christian tradition, right? In a way we've forgotten, right? And that's what I'm wondering how we, we listen to all of this work, this really rich work that animates um, nonviolent action that animates our work. So thank you for that, Carlos. It's really sure. what you've said is really powerful. And I, I, I'm hoping we can have an ongoing conversation about this though, right? Because in a way, this is where we're at what I feel is a real important, you know, a, a very important time as we engage with the powers, right? Um, 
you know, as we, it's not even the, it, yes, it's the war in Ukraine, but it's also, right, climate, like what's going on with our ecosystem and the yeah. world that, that we inhabit and dwell in and this cosmology that we're part of that is not only the material, but the spiritual, right? Um, and so I appreciate, Carlos, thank you for um, the, those insights. I really appreciate yeah. and I, and it. And I invite everyone here, if you have a chance, um, to read William Stringfellow in, in, in relationship with how we're reading Wink, right? And in a way, I sort of want to do like, you know, this Walter Wink, Stringfellow, Wiley Kellerman, Bart, like all of these theologians coming together in this space to wrestle with right? What, is it, what does it mean in our day and age now? Back to what Carlisle was saying, is like, how do we on the ground understand this, right? But, you know, that was so. one of the things that I found really helpful about Bill's book, uh, Principalities in particular. Yeah, I love it. It just kind of goes yeah. through every institution yeah. and every structure. Yeah. Um, in fact, when, when uh, Carlisle was talking, it was reminding me of the chapter about Detroit, yeah. And um, Bill's book. And I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, and I and and I and maybe we can invite Bill Wiley. He was here at the beginning of this. Right. But maybe we can have we can have more conversations with Bill because I actually our intention was to actually engage with Bill even more with this um, as a learning community, as not only just as a learning, but as an action community, like this is like a new action, like action to reanimate, renew and re-engage us in this work, right? You know, that, you know, I was telling Bill in an email that that's giving me hope with the lament I have. Like, so for me, lament is not doom and gloom. Lament is like, God, help me through this, right? Like I need help with wrestling with this. And Bill's answer was like, hey, Fernando, be in the space. What does this Pauline theology mean to you in everyday action? And what does that look like in an interfaith reality that we may be in? Um, and how do we actually animate? So maybe this is how we invite Bill back into the space um, to engage with Wink, with Stringfellow and others, right, Carlos? I mean, I really appreciate you lifting this up. And you and everyone here in this room, all of us, right, to wrestle with what all of this, this theology of the powers really means for our, our contemporary times. Yeah. So thank you, Carlos. So, if I can yeah. add one last thing, yeah, the reason please. Like, I went down this giant rabbit hole called the theology of the principalities is that yep. in either in the introduction or in the uh, in the actual ethic, um, they make a, a, a really stark claim, which is those who uh, of us who are involved in any type of social justice struggle. If we're not in, engaging the theology of the principalities, we are almost running on a treadmill. I yeah, hear, I'm paraphrasing that, but that yeah. that really just kind of made me think. Really, what you know, forty years of my life, what? <laughs> so, I it, I think it's it's extremely important, and you know, but what I'm trying to figure out is how real is this? Mm. You know, and then of course it's taking me back to: Do I believe in the resurrection? So it's mm. just been kind of quite a Lent Easter experience with the principalities theology. Yeah. And that's oh, that's 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 rich right there because that what does that mean to each of us who 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 profess Christianity like profess right this um, as our redemptive moment and how do we share that with other traditions that have their own understandings of salvation of redemption of the incarnation of you know what in their ways in their traditions and their sacredness right. Because that all of us, it takes all of us to to engage or confront, right? The powers and the principalities. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Carl. I put I'm going to put that video in our in our resource book page. I'm going to put it up there as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank Sharing. you for that. That's great. Any, anybody else? I mean, we're getting we're I know we're a little we're over time. I know we are over time, and. Um, but I do appreciate everyone's insights here today and tonight and this evening. Um, we will have one more. Uh, um, um, May 26th. Uh, 
Club Thursday. on the 26th. That's right. And so um, I invite each of you to also, um, you know, if you have insights on this, because I'm wrestling with this right now with my own work, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting each of you when we come together again um, uh, to as we as we finish this book club, how do we continue these conversations together as a community? And what does it mean for us to sustain this work? I mean, Carlos, I want all of you, right? I'm like thinking, wow, this is helping me actually do the on the ground work even more, right? Um, it's helping me not be so way up high in the sky, but really to question and critically engage with what am I doing right now? Um, and not just me, but all of us. Like, how does it, what does it mean for us to be in community with each other doing this? Morning. Right. Um, Cause that's really critical. Like, and what does it mean for us to actually engage in what, how we started this after the breakout community formation with each other? What does that look like intergenerationally and intersectional, like with all our intersectionalities, right? Um, and so that's that's my other question to each of you as we enter into our next month and we finish this book, The Powers That Be, um, and maybe need to circle back to, right, some people like William um, Stringfellow um, and others um, and reanimate the trilogy, right? Reanimate the trilogy um in this way so i appreciate each and every one of you this evening and i'm hoping that we can end with um a, a prayer from our muslim brothers and sisters as they um engage in in at the end of ramadan on monday okay so fernando yeah before you do that i would like to present a simple prayer walking into any situation God, what are we doing? Because hmm. I believe in co-creation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Paul. And so let us come into sacred space. And with our Muslim brothers and sisters in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, praise be to the Lord of the universe who has created us and made us into tribes and nations that we may know each other, not that we may despise each other. If the enemy incline towards peace, do thou also incline towards peace and trust in God. For the Lord is one that hears and knows all things. And the servants of God, most gracious, are those who walk on the earth in humility. And when we address them, we say, peace. Amin. Amin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fernando, for your time. Uh, there's so many great ideas are percolating here. Ethan just said a wonderful note about maybe doing something with Bill Stringfellow. It was the 50th anniversary of an ethics yeah. for Christians and other aliens. Maybe we could do something with Bill Wiley Kellerman. Or, but the wonderful thing about being together like this is how it percolates new ideas and community grows. So thank you so much for everything. We'll be in touch. And 